Hello, and welcome to the All Things Narrative Podcast, where we explore the relationships between the stories we love and the stories we live. I'm your host, Eric Hatch, and let's get started. Here we go, back for another Why We Love episode, speaking about the genres, and I am back here with the guys. So I got Jason, Nick, and Joe back in the house. Boys are back in town. Boys are back in town, that's right. That's right, that's right. After after dinner. (laughs) This is the after dinner podcast now. The fantasy one from last month was the the pre-dinner. So we'll see how they differ from each other. Because I don't know about you guys, but I am ready to go for this one. Now, fantasy was overwhelming, probably for all of us, because there's so much you could talk about. So many great fantasy stories. The genre we're going to talk about today is science fiction. And it's a good follow-up from fantasy because they're very easy for people to get confused. And so let's go ahead and jump right into this. You guys ready? Ready. Yep. Bet. So as we're going through these different genres using the screenwriter's taxonomy, which is just a really cool way of being able to talk about stories that you love and understand how they function according to the authors, the creators, the storytellers, because I don't know about you guys, but it's very easy sometimes to like take your preference of a film, like of what kind of film you like and apply that to every kind of film. So like, for example, I love films with really strong, deep characters with lots of emotional moments, right? You don't really get that in a lot of horror films. So I will judge a lot of horror films because, oh man, the characters just feel so one-dimensional and one-node and it's just expendable. There's not really any like deep emotion besides just fear and skit, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll just judge a horror movie and say that was trash, that was garbage, not on its own merit, on its own value, but based on how I feel because of my preferences and taste, right? Mm. And so what I love about why we're doing this series and this book of the Screenwriter's Taxonomy is it helps me appreciate and respect stories for what they are. Does the story do a good job within the genre that it operates, even if it's not a genre or a type of story that I personally resonate with. So I try to carry that. (laughs) He's setting this up so hard. (laughs) Just wait, just wait, guys. Just wait for this. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. We're going to go back to the courtroom. I know. (laughs) Guys, you have no idea what's coming for this episode. No idea. I don't even know what's fully going to be coming for this episode. I might be digging my own grave for all I know right now. There's a word that may find some friends and some enemies, and that word is tenant. (laughs) Same word backwards and forwards, right? Mm -hmm. So brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) only the great nolan could have thought of such genius and imparted that to us all right speaking of imparting things we're gonna talk about science fiction because science fiction stories do impart a lot of things to us they are a gift in and of themselves to the world because they help us think about the world in some way but yeah before i go on does that uh, what I said about resonating with, you know, different stories and judging stories, not based on their own parameters of genre, but based on how we think a story should be. Does that resonate with any of you guys? Yeah, I think that's how things mm-hmm. should be seen. And it helps to kind of eliminate and uh, understand your own blind spots to do that. Ooh, I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's why we're doing this, and we're giving these genres the time of day. Unfortunately, we probably won't do every genre that's out there by the end of the year, but we want to do a lot of the big ones, yeah. right? And science fiction, I think it's fair to say it's one of the big ones, yeah. for sure. So let's jump into it. Uh, I'll give a little description here that uh, will kind of give us an anchor point of where we're going to start uh, in talking about science fiction, and we'll go through some examples, and we'll talk about how these stories resonate with us. So here we go. The science fiction story is about taking what seems impossible and making it possible. Whereas fantasy stories bring us to an impossible world, the science fiction narrative brings the impossible to our world. 
These stories challenge our ethics of what we are willing to do for the sake of the greater good, while provoking society's notions of what desired progress might look like. In a protagonist's quest to comprehend the unknowable, they are coming to better understand themselves and their place in the world. Because even though science fiction explores realms of the technological and the alien, these are ultimately human stories about the human condition and whether humanity can be and is even worth saving. Is mankind in control of its own destiny or are we simply along for the ride? So what are your thoughts on that as a starting place for talking about science fiction? Listening to this, something that will really help us to think about is the distinction between it being fantasy is more about the world and science fiction is something being brought into the world that already exists. Right, right. And you do get a little bit of that of fantasy with magical realism, right? But there's something different about science fiction because here's kind of what I would consider to be the key, kind of like the cheat, if you will. Like, if you want to know if a story is primarily science fiction, this is your dead giveaway. And this is what I would say it is. And it's going to sound obvious and silly, but it's true. Do they use science to explain the unbelievable? Yeah. Mm. Because like magical realism, like Pinocchio, they never explain <clears throat> how just, that could happen. It just yeah. exists, it exists and you take it for granted. It's yeah. like Muppets. Just They're works. just there, right? But science fiction will actually, even if it's just a moment, even if it's just a character explaining it, there will be some indication. There's some type of explanation right? to try to say how this is possible in this exactly yeah. so like we talked at last time about superhero films mm -hmm. and how is superhero fantasy is it sci-fi well here's how we would know is there a scene where there is some sort of science that's used to explain what's happening so like x-men days of future past is an example mm -hmm. of that they have the moment in the beginning of the movie where the x-men in the future and bishop and all those guys are talking about the ramifications of time travel yeah and if it can work and the ethics of it yeah that scene right that is a dead giveaway that that's science fiction okay. and not fantasy okay. because they are using science to explain because they want it to be believable to the audience in a different way than fantasy. Fantasy creates its own rules for its own world. Science fiction creates its own rules but applies it to our world mm -hmm. and says, oh, this can happen in our world and here's what it would be look like. Mm -hmm. Avengers Endgame is another example yeah. where they're arguing about how – the quantum realm and how to go back and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I like the part where it says the protagonist quest to comprehend the unknowable. In that quest, they are coming to better understand themselves and their place in the world. So it's almost like the science part is ends up being secondary. Right. Mm -hmm. So whatever the science is trying to explain in the story, uh, it mm -hmm. says that these are ultimately human stories about the human condition. And so I think... Uh, there's a real heart in science fiction mm -hmm. that you start in the head, but ultimately it finishes in the heart. Ooh, yeah. I like that. Yes. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. And with the movies that we saw that I was watching, I was realizing it. So this different phenomenon mm -hmm. in the movies that brings the science fiction part, it reveals things about the main characters yeah. and their response to that. Right. Like mm -hmm. in, um, in Tenet and Interstellar in Inception, it's a very important part of the movie, but it reveals deeper parts of the character, what they're yearning for, what they're wanting, yeah. what they're struggling with. It creates a journey, like man's response to this threat or this tool or whatever is introduced. Yeah. Yeah. I even think the science element of it isn't really even for the people in that world. I think it's more for us as the audience. Mm, yeah. So that our That's mind good. isn't on like, okay, but this is the real world. How would that even work? Or so their focus isn't on the how to make that thing possible. It is on the characters and just being immersed in the world. Cause with fantasy, I feel like it's more like a, um, Okay, well, that's an entirely different world. Right. So that makes sense why that would work there. But in our world, it's like we want to put on like, oh, no, that that couldn't work. So when those things are explained, it's like, okay, we can move past that. And now let's focus mm -hmm. on the heart, like Nick said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and even if it's not entirely explainable to begin with, I think uh, suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. is a really important part of science fiction. Right. Where if you don't believe it in the moment, you go, okay, well, it'll be explained, and you just go, oh, well, that's cool. Oh, yeah. man, I can't believe that. And it keeps you hooked into it instead of 
becoming jaded because you think, oh, no, I don't even well, care anymore. Well, yeah. and like what what I think science fiction can do is it can help us like the things we take from it are going to be different than fantasy. Fantasy is what I would argue very personal. It's very, what can I take from fantasy and apply in my own story? Science fiction is a lot more um, global or collective in what we're taking, societal. right? Mm. Yeah, it's societal. So for example, a lot of science fiction films deal with AI mm. and the inevitability of if we go keep going too far with technology, what's going to happen with AI? Yeah. So you get something like uh, like Mitchell's versus the machines. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but where you your phone becomes autonomous, mm. and now it is its own entity, and it can take control of other technology because everything's linked with the cloud and all mm. that, right? On that whole thing. Oh, wow. So it, even though it's like a you know it's like a, just a fun family film yeah. there's actually a lot of really deep things it's asking but it's challenging us all to think about have we given ourselves too much mm. dependency on technology to where we're losing sight of the relationships in front of us mm. and we're not taking an active control over our own lives right yeah so that's a question that yes we can answer personally mm. but really we need as a society we need to answer that question because if we don't then we could very well be screwed, right? So that's a lot of what science fiction is. There's a lot of almost doom and gloom and apocalyptic kind of notions about it mm. uh, when you think about it. So, No, it makes me think of I Am Robot mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good example. Yeah. yeah. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think of I Am Robot. Yeah. yeah. Well, in AI, there's Eagle Eye, there's Terminator, there's mm -hmm. a bunch mm -hmm. of stuff like that. Yeah. And we keep going forward. Yeah, I think uh, on the downside, there's like like a despair almost with yeah. science fiction. Yeah. But on the upside, there's like a tremendous hope and mm -hmm. it like pushes forward humanity uh, and it doesn't give up hope. Like there's always a, a tomorrow or a future where there is a future. Yeah. yeah. Like the oh, Matrix. Absolutely. Yeah. It is like the mm -hmm. Matrix. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. That's an example. Some of pretty extreme poles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it does. And some sci fi <laughs> can be very cynical can yeah, be very yeah. gloomy and some of it can be more optimistic right yeah. I, so oh well, go ahead i was gonna say for the societal ones one that uh, i don't know if we were going to mention it but i figured it absolutely deserves a mention is the twilight zone twilight oh zone my gosh black yes mirror, is black mirror i think it was called yeah black mirror uh-huh yeah those mm -hmm. are very societal and oftentimes they are uh gloomy but sometimes they're just kind of a little bit more lighthearted. but that's a huge one and i think it was yeah, very influential. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up because the Twilight Zone essentially brought three genres into the mainstream oh. uh, in terms of television. So we've talked about the metaphysical journey, right? So mm -hmm. I would say a good portion of Twilight Zone episodes are that. Some of them are horror, and the Twilight Zone did a lot when we get to the horror episode. Mm -hmm. It did a lot to make horror mainstream mm -hmm. and sci-fi. I would yeah. say about a third of the Twilight Zone is at least maybe even half yeah. is is good science fiction that not only did it push the limits in terms of what you could do on television, but the issues that it wrestles with. Because remember, the Twilight Zone was created before we even went to space. Mm. So there were all mm. kinds of questions wow. that people were wrestling with about of what happens if we get to space and we find something. Yeah. Is it going to change us, right? So there's a lot of good Twilight Zone that uses sci-fi and mixes it with social commentary. So you guys ever heard of the Monsters Are Due on Maple Street? Yeah. No. Yeah. I've heard of Yeah, tell that. walk us through that, Nick. That uh, episode. they the houses start flickering mm -hmm. and the, the neighbors kinda feel like they're getting attacked and then paranoia starts like running through the whole town and they start turning on each other, I think. Yeah. And at the end it's like the aliens are playing a game and they're like, Look what we could do. Like all it takes is for them to Yeah, they I they think they think there's somebody they suspect is an alien because they're trying to yeah. figure it out. So right? it's like the Soviets and things like that. When, mm -hmm. when okay, yeah, okay. like the Cold War yeah, and all that. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of good science fiction will mix like like alien. Like huh. there's literally just aliens pushing buttons, and that's what you realize it's all about, right? That's wild. That's a science fiction piece, but What's it's the social commentary. The monsters are due on Maple Street. Okay. It's, it's one of the most the famous the episodes. The Twilight Box. Zone is awesome. There's so many episodes that. The the invaders is one of my the favorite. invaders yes the invaders is so cool it's basically silent 
and like oh these, wow okay like these little robots come in and like attack this woman who's just like making dinner yeah it's black and white and silent and the robots are like hiding underneath the bed and like around the corner and she's like paranoid in the house by herself trying to survive and then she kills the robot at the end and the robot ends up being us that we went to another planet and she's a giant monster. Oh. And the robot's like, Mayday, Mayday, this planet's not friendly. We need help. And the woman that we're rooting for yeah. the whole time ends it, up being the monster. That's why. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's dope. They would it's regularly so pull yeah. stuff like that. That's too. Yeah. So you're just like, oh. there's, there, I, I remember when I was watching every episode at one time, I got to a point where I was like, I think I know the twist by now. Yeah. And they just keep getting, you know, there's They're a great. few I could predict, but most of them. I couldn't, you know? One of my favorites, and I know this is a cliched one to say, but Eye of the Beholder. No, that's, that's not cliche is that the one with that the, awesome. the, like, No, no, I mean cliche as in everybody loves that episode. Oh, yeah. oh, is that the one where like the faces, the yeah. other face is like really ugly and they yeah. turn into a regular person and all the other people have like ugly faces? Their like, faces ah! are distorted, yeah. That one always gets me every mm-hmm. time with the world building and the... This, right this. but the whole concept but but the whole idea that beauty is subjective and it's in the eye of the beholder mm. is wild to think about you know that you could have the most beautiful person in our eyes but if everybody was ugly around them they would think they're ugly mm-hmm. that's fascinating so good sci-fi explores human nature right yep. through these different concepts so let's get into more examples so when we talk about the spectrum of comedy and drama for example So a sci-fi that would be more comedic would be something like Free Guy, where you have, what if a video game character became autonomous? What what would that look like, right? And then ah, that movie actually had a pretty good twist that got me. Really? Um, Yeah, you guys, have you guys seen it? No. Are you guys going to see it? No. No. Spoiler alert. (laughs) He learned, so basically there's somebody who programmed uh, the the game. He ends up being Kang. Kang programmed it. Kang Kang programmed it. Oh my gosh. (laughs) But they actually realized that the character, Ryan Reynolds' character, right? Because it's about him becoming autonomous uh, in this like Grand Theft Auto kind of game. And he like wants to just be a good guy and just wants to help everybody while everybody else just wants to kill each other, right? So there's lots of commentaries. I love that movie because there's lots of commentaries about our society and how cynical we are and how would we treat somebody who is optimistic and, you know, just trying to do good. But then you realize that he is uh, an extension of a real human, that a real human programmed his human self into the game. And so there's some interesting implications there of like his connection with this character and whatnot. It's very Truman Show like Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways because he doesn't know he's in a video game. Yeah. And so he's slowly realizing it. It's stranger than fiction. Yes. It's a lot like stranger than fiction too. So I'm just a sucker for those kind of stories. But there's a, a sci-fi story that leans more on the drama side. Okay, have you guys ever heard of an anime that came out a couple years ago called Bell? No. No. I don't so, think so. So it's no. on HBO. I think it's on HBO Max. Who has HBO so, Max? I do. Ronnie does. So yes. Bell. Yeah, Ronnie so, <laughs> Aside from being like some of the most gorgeous anime you'll ever see. So it takes Beauty and the Beast. It's a fantasy story, right? Okay. But it takes it and it brings a sci-fi edge because it's about this like virtual reality world that everybody's living in. And so the person, the, you know, Belle, the one who's the one that everybody loves and thinks is cool Mm -hmm. in real life is a nobody. And in the virtual reality world, there's this beast that's like terrifying everybody. And you find out that the beast is an abused kid who's taking out his abuse in the virtual reality world. I cried in that movie yeah. because it's literally about this girl trying to find this boy and help him from being – take him away from being abused. Wow. It was so emotional. Oh, wow. ha- that's like one of the most that's emotional what- sci-fi movies I've ever seen because it's Beauty and the Beast. The yeah. beauty's trying to rescue the beast. But then once you realize that she's just trying – it's just a kid who gets beat by his dad. Damn, bro. And you're just like that's what makes him the beast, you know? And, and the way that he, in virtual reality, takes that out on everybody. He has the power that he has no power in his real life to have. Dang, you just hit us off with it. <laughs> That's what good sci-fi can Man. do, though. That's what it can do is, like, if you have a sci-fi story that is emotional, that you've really created something special. Yeah. You really have there, right?
Here's some sci-fi mixed with different other super genres that we could talk about. I recently rewatched Jurassic Park. And so that's a quintessential science fiction. But one of the things, I hadn't seen Jurassic Park in a long time. One of the things that I really had forgotten about is how horrific it is. Yeah. Like how oh, it's, it's staged like a horror film, yeah. right? Like all of a sudden, when you're in that third act of the first Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. you are in a horror movie. The yeah. way it's shot, the music cues, When the raptors everything. are in the kitchen yep. and stuff like mm -hmm, that. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So is that's that, a good example. That, yeah. Is that horror or thriller? Th sorry, you're right. Thriller. Because, yeah, it's more of a thriller. Okay. What's the way? So what's the difference then? So horror is really focused. Thriller is more focused on, we'll, we'll do horror and thriller yeah. at one time. Thriller is more focused on a feeling that you get as you watch it. Um, it's like it's like suspense. Yes. Okay. Um, but horror I always associate with evil. Yes. And I don't really think Jurassic Park lens right you know you're correct towards that okay. horror is is where a, a point of evil is centralized mm -hmm. on a specific character or set of creatures but and then, the goal is to defeat those things but that's the dinosaurs then but they're kind, not evil they're a product of mankind's own creation mankind which is evil product. right so uh, they're based on evil I th but the creatures there's a technic aren't. there's a technicality there but okay it's not like they're it's also like they're humans. also animals. Okay. They're also just animals being themselves. They're, yeah. They're yeah. they're carnivores. Um. So it's not like it's a different like, kind of evil. Like okay. if you have Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, that would be more considered a thriller in my mind. Yeah. Than a horror, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Oh, I, gotta say I think that they classify but, that as horror. Yeah, I feel like they. I know that's why it's weird tricky. One. This is yeah. a weird one. Well, we got a lot of research we'll do before yeah. we get to we'll that one. We'll clarify it in the next. We'll clarify it when like, we get I there. Do exactly. Like that movie too. Yeah, the birds. We'll yeah, the birds. the birds. My mom birds. hates that movie because really? of the birds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, we'll, we're that definitely talking so about good. Alfred Hitchcock no. when we get to thriller and horror because you can't it's not horrifying. talk about that without yeah. him. Um, so another uh, sci-fi uh, fantasy, actually. So this is an interesting one because we just did the fantasy episode. So Dune, Ooh. because here's the thing: Dune, Dune it's different. It's not quite our world, it's right? It's not our world, no. It's yeah. not our world, but the thing with Dune is that it compared to like the fantasy stuff we were talking about, like Star Wars and all that, Dune actually has a science to what they're doing. And they spend quite a bit of time explaining the science. Does like it, with the like of heart like, like with the spice, mm -hmm, with the exactly. way that the desert works. Um there's even a religious aspect to Absolutely it. Absolutely, there so is. So does Dune feel like a society of, like, <coughs> a society that probably came from what we are now? Or is it like, it just feels completely different, like how Star Wars? It, it, it no. is pretty fantastic. I will say it is. It is pretty fantastical, but. But, like, if, like, in, like, 25,000 years from now, right. could this happen in our future? Well, the villain is, like, a monster. Yeah. Yeah, at least for part one. Yeah, part okay. two, it'll be different. But yeah, there is very okay. much a no. monster. But again, you're on other planets too. You're not yeah. on yeah, Earth. Yeah, this is this is I, this is more fantasy. It leans more towards fantasy. So that's why I'm asking. So, this, but so then, how is it in our the scientific? Because there is, unlike a lot of fantasy that we talked about, there is science that's being used. To Good say, point. oh, this is possible. Mm. So, which is which gives me kind of a sense of like, well, maybe do they imagine that it's our world in the long distant future? That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's like to them, it's not a fantasy, and there's a science fiction component to it. Okay, like it's a fantasy with science fiction component. Yeah, um, and it's cool. So I just Cuts. and it's cool. Argue that it fits. Yeah, I I love it. Dune. Was my big surprise hit of 2021. Yeah, it was good because I I knew it was going to be good, but. I didn't know it was going to be like that good. Yeah. And part two, I really think we should go see part two in theaters. I have to, I have to watch part one first. Probably yeah. It's worth it. I, th I think what I really liked about that, and you could, I know this is more fantasy we didn't talk about, but Avatar, you could say this too. Yeah, there's a little bit of that in there as well. Well, I was going to say that Dune explores how just this resource can cause greed of control for power. Yeah. Uh, all these different things to be pull, uh, pulled out of society mm -hmm. and the fight for it. Even how, and the, the, I'm going to say some spoilers, even how, uh, not the Harkonnen, House Atreides 
mm-hmm. where uh, the guy says, "Oh, we're we're gonna use it for good. We're gonna use this desert power for a good thing." Right, right. Maybe in your eyes, but that's in the gray. Yeah. To the people who are indigenous to the area. No, it's not. It's a sacred yeah. thing, and I think that's pretty inter- well, interesting. How a psych, uh, a scientific element, a science fiction element, can be mm-hmm. seen from a religious point of view with to the characters well, in this. Yeah, because Dune movie. is Dune is a lot about power and how you wield power, right? Mm-hmm. And science is how they wield that power uh, in Dune. So that's why I feel like it would fall more under a science fiction. But that director, uh, what's his name? How do you pronounce his name, Nick? Velen- Villeneuve. 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 I think he is pro- he is my favorite Villeneuve. science fiction director right now. I would definitely agree with that. He he over what Nolan. he over Nolan, over, no. over anybody. What else has he directed? I was, I was gonna ask that. Too. Blade Runner. Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Oh, the one I didn't get to. And then Arrival. Arrival. Oh, also. he made yeah. Arrival too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, was that one good? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like. Arrival. Yeah. So this guy, oh, we'll I think I think he's on fire right now. Okay. Like he is my favorite sci fi director working right now. Which is this? Maybe a good time to talk about Blade Runner. We can go into it. Uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Is it going to get spoilery? It sure will. Uh, well, we'll talk about the first Blade Runner. We'll talk about the first yeah. Blade Runner because I do see so the interesting thing Basically, about it's Wally, Blade Runner, and Wally are very. I will be very there is a lot. There is a lot of similarity there. Wally, there is no Wally without Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, I I would say Wally is Blade Runner plus two thousand one Space Odyssey. Mm-hmm. That's funny. So. I should leave the room. Well, you've seen the first one, right? No. You haven't seen any Blade Runner? Me neither. Yeah. Oh, man. You guys are going to have to leave the room. Yeah. All right. Well, so, uh, right, come on. So, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so Blade Runner is a metaphysical journey as well, right? So it's a sci-fi that has meta- a metaphysical journey built in. Because the central question that Blade Runner is uh, asking is what, is, what is a human being? Yeah. Right? So I've seen the first Blade Runner. What do you think of the first Blade Runner, Nick? Um, that it's old. <laughs> compared, <laughs> compared to 20, 2049, it's really old. That's fair. Um, I I I so did not... Ugh, I feel so weird saying this. Anyway. I love the world of Blade Runner and the visuals and all the things everybody loves about it. It did not blow me away. Mm-hmm. Maybe if I was there in the 1980s seeing it, it would have. But it just didn't. Mm-hmm. I think it lacked an emotional connection with me. But I love the ending. Um, it's too bad she won't live. But then again, who does? It's a so, great, great. There are so many movies great that, quote. Seen that are just floating around, and I have to rewatch to, to bring them back. Yeah, really? yeah. Um, yeah, no, I don't remember too much of it. Yeah. Of which movie? Blade of the, the first, first Blade one. Runner. Okay. The first one. Yeah. 2049 on the other hand. Back to spoiler mode? Which we... I didn't I didn't know well, if I was going to watch that movie or not until you pushed me. Mm-hmm. You pushed me to watch it. And I'm glad you did. That's one of the most beautifully made movies. I 100% agree. In my opinion. That is some cinema, of the... It's gorgeous. Gorgeous. It is... S- Good. And it doesn't surprise me because of Dune. Dune mm-hmm. is also gorgeous, and well, it's the same. I think it's the same cinematographer. It's the same cinematographer and the same. Um, it's Hans Zimmer doing this because mm-hmm. the score is oh. also what I think makes those two movies of Dune and Blade Runner. We love twenty forty nine. Well, Zimmer is really good with sci fi, mm-hmm. like as we'll see with other films too. Um, he does really good with sci fi. I texted you guys. The, the first five minutes of 2049, there's like no dialogue. Mm-hmm. It's just music and establishing shots. Ooh, like and I'm Wally. just like, That's I'm like, just like, I'm in. Mm-hmm. I'm hype. I don't know what the story is. It's got a really good it's villain. Wally. And not Jared Leto, the, no. the girl. The girl. Yeah. Um, Jared oh, Leto. Uh, Jared Leto. Awesome. Jared Leto is the weakest part of that movie. Yeah, I've for heard me. that. I've too. heard that. Yeah. He, when is he the strongest? He player? feels like he's trying too hard mm-hmm. to blend into this Every world. Movie. Sounds like an air movie. But I mean, everybody else is good. Ryan Gosling's good. And the, the uh, climax with Harrison the, Ford the fight in the water. I oh think my gosh! I, the, the, the fight in the water. The the score of that is like right up there with Tenet. Probably better than Tenet. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's yeah. way better than Tenet. No, we'll slow down. Slow down. <laughs> 
No, we listen. We listened to Tennis Score on the way here. Tenet it it was kicking. Of, Tenet is a lot of fun. Probably yeah. better than Inception Score. Stop. Actually. Shut your mouth. For our listeners out there, Stop. I have not seen Tenet. We're so. not there yet. <laughs> no, I will there. say, I think it's funny that Hans Zimmer is probably the one thing that we Han, all agree on. Hans Zimmer yeah. didn't do table. Tenet though. Yeah, but I don't care. We're not talking the about the other guy yet. did, and he's good too. Yeah, so. but no, anyways, but back, Hans Zimmer, I feel like yeah, we all agree. Hans Zimmer is that's like the one thing. Yeah, I think he's one of the the best composers right now. But yeah, in 2049 nice. though, Nick, you were you were right. It had a really good story. It mm-hmm. was emotionally engaging. And it paid um, homage to the it, to the original. It, it was it was basically the Top Gun Maverick to Top yeah. Gun. Where I didn't mm. I'm I don't really like the first Top Gun, yeah. but I really like Top, Top Gun. Would you Maverick. recommend mm. to see the first Blade Runner before this one or uh, do you honestly, think you could, I don't think no. you need to. Really? You don't, really? If, I, if, if, if I yeah, told I you one thing about the original Blade Runner, you would know everything you need to know for yeah. 2049. Yeah, okay. I agree. If I, just, just it. One thing you need to know. You want a spoiler right now? Sure. Maybe. Spoiler alert out there. The only thing you need to know about the original Blade Runner is that Harrison Ford's character is a Blade Runner. And what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to hunt down these, what Not would a, you call them? Like humanoid? Are they artificial like, humans? Go ahead. Basically machines that look human and have become autonomous outside of their programming. So androids? I oh, guess he's in now. Yeah, I guess you would call <laughs> it. Yeah. Disobedient Blade Runners. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Harrison Ford finds one, falls in love, and oh. they do it. That's uh, all what? you need to know for 2049. That's it. Okay. That, like that that's all you questions. need to know. But okay. Because that's what the whole plot too. of 2049 is centered around. Is he sex. fell in love and he did it. Which, by the way. With a robot. Nice. Go ahead. Go, go there. <laughs> So 2049 had some interesting... Yes, it did. <laughs> yes, it did. It did. You know well, what I'm talking yes. about. There are some unique takes on the sexual experience in What What did you think of the sexual experience in 2049? Is spoiler territory? I thought it was awesome, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was, like, interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right, so... I'm- Nick a little so bit. should I save this for my honeymoon? A bit. <laughs> should I save the watches movie for my honeymoon? No, 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 no. With Nancy. You, you don't know what I'm talking about. It's like, uh, it's, uh, I'm not going to spoil it for you. It's okay, true. Uh, it is an ex- it, I've never seen a sexual experience mm-hmm. in a film like that before. Interesting. And it, I, and it wasn't normally like if there's like a sex scene or something like that, I don't care. This was like, yeah, this was like, uh, huh? This was. This might be what the future. This is. <laughs> this, this might be yes. the future. Yes, okay. I thought the same thing. I'm Seriously. like, this is where things could go mm-hmm. with sex. Oh, all right. It then. wasn't just a sex scene for sex. No, it, it was. was there's a purpose behind yeah, it. Was okay. one, it was one. It might have to be the most purposeful full sex fe- scene I've and ever that's seen. That's why it was awesome. Get your heads out the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. I, I bet. Yeah, that. Is, so I my favorite character is. Um, Nick, help me out. What's her name? The girl. <laughs> no, I was Anna wondering. Yeah. I don't what, know her name. What's her name? I don't know. Oh, it's Joy, right? I got the Joy. Maybe. Joy? Joy, Joy. Let's call her Joy. She she was my favorite character in the film because I never thought that there was an AI type character like that mm-hmm. that I could actually feel something for. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. I know. Okay. You must not have played Halo. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I never really got into Halo. Cortana. <laughs> but yeah, 2049. Easily one of the best sci-fi films. It's not that far away, to be honest. No, I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's a little, that's a little scary. Here's something weird. Uh, we talked about X Men: Days of Future Past, right? Yeah. We are now in the future <laughs> of Days of Future Past, twenty twenty three. I dressed up as Bishop too. That's, yeah, that's he my, dressed up as Bishop. I was about to unleash my sentinel. So program. it was appropriate he there for trust. sure. <laughs> All right, my so life. let's talk about the fact that. Some of these sci-fi films we're talking about, like Dune and Blade Runner, they have this almost post-apocalyptic feel to them. Mm -hmm. Like something major happened that changed the world, right? So that is a big piece of sci-fi because some sci-fi films take place during the apocalypse itself Mm -hmm. and others are post-apocalyptic, which is after that happened. Like uh, Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now here's a series that did both. And did both really well. 
Planet of the Apes. Yeah. I was going to say that. Yeah. I it's, haven't seen it, but it sounds it's like... It's brilliant it. because the original Planet of the Apes is post the apocalypse, mm-hmm. right? And it's one of the greatest film twists ever in history, even though everybody in the world knows it now. Yeah. It is still one of the greatest, which, by the way, was written by Rod Serling. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know so, that. Oh, that's uh, so yeah. That's so, yeah. That's yeah. So he okay. wrote Planet of the Apes, huh. and it Finish. feels like a tw- yeah, an extended Finish. Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. Really does. But then you get this Matt Reeves prequel trilogy. Yeah. That we've talked about a little bit with us. Nick hasn't been a part of that conversation though, so we got to get him in. But Rise, Dawn, and mm-hmm. War, and that shows the apocalypse. And I got to tell you. I just watched those films for the first time because of you guys, and I love them. Yeah, like bro. I thought they were amazing. Yeah. Like when Dawn started out, wa- watch. Do- I disagree. You think War is the best one? Yeah, I you do. Th- you think War? Yeah, I like Dawn. Dawn Rise. I think Rise. The second one. Yeah, the, no, oh. Dawn's the second one. Dawn is the second, is the okay, second yeah. one. Rise is the first Dawn one. Dawn is my favorite. So Dawn, the beginning is chilling. Yeah. After watching it post COVID. Yeah. It's chilling. It's literally like that movie knew what would happen mm-hmm. with a pandemic. I just wild. Like, what's the Koba? Yeah, Koba swings that machine gun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the best. That, no, is that scary. whole fight scene, yeah. just like yeah. when he was on the tank and things like that, and riding in. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, oh, man. Is the one. We, should, we should watch it tonight. <laughs> I, I I'm down. It. I'm down. I haven't I, seen it, so I'd be though. down for it. Yeah. After Tenet? Yeah, after Tenet. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Let's go. I, my favorite is War because I love the character study of Caesar mm. because it it's taking Caesar's pain because there's a lot of pain he goes through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there's also this pride that no matter how bad things are getting, Caesar has to... Be the strong one. Has to be the strong one, but not strong for everybody, yeah. for himself. Yeah. He just wants to kill this guy because he wants revenge. He's losing slight sight of why he's doing what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And he has to, st- like, right? It's a good character drama yeah. of Caesar. But War has my favorite scene of all three films. And that's with Woody Harrelson, the scene with him and Caesar. And Woody Harrelson's talking about what he had to do. Mm. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. I'm not going to spoil it for you, Jason. Yeah, we can't spoil it. Thank you, man. He's the antagonist of that film, but he's an antagonist that... You can sympathize with and understand. Well, I don't even sympathize. You understand. You understand really well. Yeah. And when he explains... Because Woody Harrelson's a great actor. When he explains what he had to do in order to survive, like in order for humanity to survive, because that's the conundrum that a lot of sci-fi films wrestle with is is the sacrifice of one or or your well-being mm-hmm. for the greater good of humanity worth it right for posterity <laughs> yeah yeah that, to yeah. my new he hasn't seen it enough times <laughs> <laughs> i've only seen it once but yeah but war right like the woody harrelson was interviewed and said he hates how he acted in that movie really? why he, he, he doesn't like his performance you could look it up he doesn't like it oh that's all. interesting what does he like about it uh, he, it doesn't say specifically. It just says like roles that he could go back and do differently. Hmm. That's just, interesting. Like, it trails his career. I think he's one of the strongest things about that movie. I think my favorite scene in all the movies is Cobra. Is Cobra with it, a machine gun? Yeah, with him <laughs> acting because it's, yes, it's no, really yes, horrifying. Yes, and suspenseful. Um, and I really like Cobra and Caesar's dynamic. Mm-hmm. I think the variety aspect each other, of it. Yeah, and how layered that com- that relationship mm-hmm. is, and then Cobra just. It's right. it's you're watching a whole family yes. split apart. Yeah, yes. and, that's hard. And it's not even like a, oh we split apart, but we can try to find a way to come back. No, it's just it's it's, it's gone. That's war. Yeah, <laughs> best yeah. best um, motion capture ever. Yes. Yeah, and the guy that wore the good. costume at MegaCon, mm-hmm. number one. Yes. Oh my yes. gosh, that was no, the best no, costume we saw outfit, all day yeah, at yeah, MegaCon. Yes, we should put I, that oh, as the background that. of it, right? You guys have pictures of that. Mm-hmm. I got a picture of it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I that was probably that. my favorite costume I saw all day. That was so good because you're not just doing one motion capture like a like a Smeagol or a Thanos. You're doing you're doing an entire group. There's a whole group of people that have to learn how to move like mm-hmm. apes yep. and and they look great too. And they, like, oh they my still look gosh, great. it looks so good. One, well, I mean, I think war. Is also not just this, the motion capture. One of the things I really like about it as well is the cinematography of war. Mm-hmm. Like getting the motion capture and the way it captures like 
all these apes riding horses in the mm-hmm. snow yeah, or on is, the beach. Yeah. War is really good. It is, yeah. it is a gorgeous film. Yeah. For being, ironically, being this film about war and all these terrible things, yeah, it's yeah. really good to look at. How did you classify that as a... For Planet of the Apes? Yeah. It's that apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic... Because there's still science involved yeah, with the house. Oh, it's definitely science yeah. fiction. That could be just a straight war genre. Yeah. I think by the time you get to the third one, yeah, yeah for sure. But I still think at its heart, it's a it's a good science fiction. Uh, some of the best that we have. So, And, you know, in addition to the post-apocalyptic, you also have a whole section of science fiction called the dystopia. So the dystopia, you've got your 1984s, your Brave New World, your Fahrenheit 451s, right? Which we talked about. I think we talked about that on the metaphysical journey, right, Nick? Jason? I think we talked sure. a little bit about Fahrenheit dystopias. I well, just in general, we those types of I can't remember what dystopias we talked about. Yeah, but one of them for sure that you could see that's a, a sci-fi dystopia. And it even blends a little bit of romance in it as well is Hunger Games. Yes, no, we did talk about that. We talked about that on a, on a, one of the Why We Loves last year. Because mm-hmm. um, we said Joni's see Catching Fire. Cause oh, yeah. Catching oh, Fire is a fire yeah. film. Have you I seen the fire. first one? I've Of Hunger Games, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've seen, I think, at least like two of them. The second one is really good. It's worth a rewatch. I know what happens in it. Like, I haven't seen the movies fully, but I know, you know, she kills the headmaster like the lady and things like that. Oh, like that's I know, no, that's, that's I know, the last that's, one. I know that like, that's the, the last, last one. You know where it goes, yeah. 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 But so, I've never sat down and just watched all of them. So I read the books Me too. completely. But okay. I've never done this before. I've never read an entire book you series book? and then watched a movie. No, I've read at least four books in my life. Um, <laughs> I, those me. were three of them. Three yeah, of them. More than me. Hey, I got to beat <laughs> Big Boss. That's why you teach second grade. <laughs> no, uh... <laughs> Wow! Uh, That's why. That's why I got to teach third and fourth. So and left. left. So, anyways, um, what I so I watched. I read those three books, and then I watched the movies, and there was still a lot of merit, and they were pretty Mm. faithful um, for the most part. Definitely worth a rewatch. But yeah. Yeah, no, that one is, is dystopian, and I don't know what more to say about it than we already have. You yeah, might help me yeah, out. no, dystopia, just saying that it's another science fiction piece of the puzzle, mm-hmm. you know? A um, lot of great dystopias out there. One, but, one thing that I think is cool <coughs> about Hunger Games is that yeah. the science fiction element in it didn't cause the dystopian like world. It was a real world event that could happen to us, mm-hmm. then then brought about a force change of this almost science fiction world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it was. It was. It, it, I mean, it was a tool. The elements that are different than our world were used as a tool for it. And there's this thing, you know, they have a splicing of animal genes. They have all this technology that they use to keep the Hunger Games going, and also they even weaponize it. So there's this area where they defend the capital. That it's almost like they're back in the Hunger Games with all the models Honestly, they use and all this stuff. And it's, it's the, pretty crazy. The more but- time goes on, the more believable I could see that scenario. The idea of entertainment, like scripted entertainment, not being enough for people anymore. Mm-hmm. And now they want something with real stakes. So this reality TV thing. But I could also see this whole thing of a society where it's like, we live in the capital and the cap the people in the capital are basically trained to think that you know they are living in this very like lush for them mm-hmm. but they also think it's fair mm-hmm. i think that's the wild thing about the hunger games is it's almost like i don't know if i want to quite say socialist but there's this idea of like the government is supplying everything for everybody but it's also taking from like everybody's doing their part and Mm -hmm. the capital is sitting there going yeah we're doing our part too yeah Yeah. so it's fair but obviously it's not fair yeah yeah Yeah. so like a whole it's disturbing a whole government of affluenza and the thing is right now things kind of teeter on that they yeah have we ever well we we are the capital yeah. In all yeah. honesty, but has society have we really ever gotten rid of the gladiator games? Because I don't think we still have Uf, Uf, UFC. We still have boxes. we softened it's, it's, it. It's we have matadors like this. Yeah, 
this te- this dance around violence and throwing people's lives to to chance and skill it's still existed since that no? i was like, watching something on instagram and this man was talking about the roman circus and how yes, the government, yes, u- yeah, the government <laughs> uses it to distract the people football right. mm-hmm. you, yeah it's just a whole oh. distraction well and the way Bo-pain. but the way the hunger games Bo-pain. does that Bo-pain is accessories. through you know <laughs> I'm so sorry. Sorry. That was that was funny for no reason. <laughs> uh, okay. There's good times up in John here. King of the Hill. <laughs> King of the Hill slice is of slice life. of life. Uh, yeah, undoubtedly. Historical fiction. <laughs> <laughs> That's just Jason. <laughs> Historical <laughs> fiction, slice of life. It's it's really autobiography. <laughs> You're right, autobiography. <laughs> It's, it's it's of my future self that I went back in time and told myself to write it. Oh my! Oh gosh. my gosh! That's good. King no. of the and I want to go watch King of the Hill. You do? <laughs> <laughs> Someone else does. So I life? no Jason. We, so Jason, family? we talked about this on the car ride to Universal. King of the Hill is a huge guilty pleasure of mine. I am. Must have forgotten. You probably you're probably not not deep sleep on the way back. I must have been neuralized. Yeah, I think so. Bro, King of the Hill can make me laugh so hard, and I love it because (laughs) it's a show about the most mundane things blown out of proportion. Like it's like the regular show. It's fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But but the thing is, is there's people really like that. There's yes, uh it's not so far exaggerated. Uh, (laughs) I mean, my power was based off of a real call that they got. Fr- about um, Beavis and Butthead. Something my, really sounded like that, and they're like, he's a character now. My favorite King of the Hill episode is when the Canadians move in, and the Canadian is like, like he they he offers him beer, like regular, just generic, like, right? Texas American beer, and he's like, oh, no thanks. That stuff tastes like dishwater. And he drinks <laughs> his Canadian beer, and it leads to, like, this fuming rage. And I'm like, there are people that get offended by beer. Yeah. yeah. You know, you and then the episode too? culminates. <laughs> the episode culminates in a lawnmower race. It's truly like it, it's peak fiction. It's peak everything. It's peak slice of life, and I'm tickled that it <laughs> that the antithesis. I'm I am tickled that the antithesis of science fiction <laughs> somehow made five minutes of a piece. <laughs> <laughs> And it may be edited out, but if it's if it becomes I don't know its own if little this out yet. if it becomes its own little ten mm. minute extra short on the side, then I'll be extra tickled. So yeah, aliens. It's the, it's the yeah, Joe again. aliens. It's the t- uh, science aliens. fiction. Aliens. Science fiction, aliens. Um, aliens. Tim Burton made a trash movie. Yeah. Let's get back on track. <laughs> here. I don't know if trash is the right word. Wait, campy maybe. is another word. No, Wait, which aliens? This movie, aliens with um, what's his name? Mars Attacks. Oh, with Mars Attack. Yeah. Um, it's campy. Yeah, it's okay. not trash. Yeah. Okay. It's silly. It's not serious. It's okay. If it was silly <laughs> and campy B, B movie stuff, it I would de- love it. it. it I would love it, but here's what Tim Burton did. Is that the brain here's, alien one? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> 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 like, what are they so like? <laughs> <laughs> that is. Bro, that's, that's not like, serious. Yes. <laughs> All right. Hear me out here, okay? That's what we're gonna hear. Right? I love, I love the aliens, and I love all that the aliens do in the movie. Yeah. I think it's amazing. The designs, <laughs> everything's over the Where's top. Where's your butt? There. <laughs> My butt is that gets this all-star cast and wastes them. Tell me one good performance in that movie that's memorable, iconic in any way with the aliens. Evander Holyfield. No, <laughs> it, all he does is walk around in like a King Tut tutu. He punches yeah. through the glass and straight to the alien face. He's the only one who could do that in a movie. Iconic. Big- <laughs> <laughs> I, you asked. Iconic. You asked, and he gave one. <laughs> No. I think Jack, 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 Black, Jack, Jack Black gives a, a no. Decent, he's wasted, he bro. A, he, he dies. He gets two seats. He, he dies. <laughs> no, he Jack. Dies. Well, no, that's the whole point. It's like Tim Burton said, "Let me get all these amazing actors and, and just and death kill ray them him. off." Yeah. And death but, ray him by but it's but it's not even aliens. like because here's the thing. This is why I think this is Tim, one of Tim Burton's <laughs> low points. Like Tim Burton is a good storyteller, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, he's just having fun. I am. <laughs> oh, Every single scene with the aliens is the same scene. Oh, maybe things will go well this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. 
<laughs> Alien, oh. Alien just shoots a bunch of people. There are far worse and that's movies it. that you could put on at midnight. There's nothing creative about it. It's literally oh. just the same scene over and over again. If you're scrolling on the TV guide and you see Mars attacks late at night, do you skip it? It depends. No, you uh, don't. No, you don't. It's just like, let's watch these aliens. Just, no, just I don't people. skip it because I don't think it's a bad movie right. at the end of the day. Oh Not like Tenet. No. Hey. I'll take Mars Attacks over Tenet oh, any day. <laughs> Mars Attacks is good, though. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Mars, talk about exaggeration. You're right. These aliens. That's so funny. I mean... Like, I grew up watching that movie. I, didn't even I thought it was Jack, hilarious. I didn't realize but Jack it's a, Black was in it. For how movie. campy it is, it's really it. kind of yeah. dull. Like, it's just the same thing that keeps happening. Well, okay, I will say, though, that I love that the entire aliens are defeated by that one song. Yeah, <laughs> one, one bad song. song and one bad explode. song. Wait, you know what's funny, though? That's what they did um, with Star Trek, the, the third one. Um, really? Yeah, with the... Uh, they. I forget his name, Kurt. <laughs> Played the uh, the Beastie Boys song and was going around <laughs> what? and blowing it. Up. I think that's what it was. I a think Beastie that's the Boys song, song in a I'm Star Trek you, that's movie. That's exactly what they did uh, for Star Trek. I not Into the Darkness, but the third one. I've never seen Star Trek anything because I know it's a rabbit hole I'll never get out of. Really? Because there's, I mean, there's so many shows and movies, <clears> and <throat> once you're in, you're in. It's like Doctor Who. I haven't gotten a, a Doctor Who either because you'll be in it. You won't you'll come be out. In it. Be in Fifty year TV show. All right, I got one more before we talk about you know what. Interstellar. Yeah, all, all, well, before we talk about Nolan. Uh, oh God, yeah, okay, they play they play sabotage because the Sorry. sabotage. I love that yeah, they song. Play sabotage. That's, that's the song I play when my kids wreck the house. That's funny. <laughs> that's actually really funny. Um, time travel. We got to talk about time travel, and yes, this will segue. Looper. This will segue Back into the into yeah. Nolan and stuff. Oh. So that yeah, Looper, no Loopers, Looper. yeah. yeah, which yeah. I haven't seen Looper, but I I've heard it's pretty good. I like Looper. Looper is good. Mm-hmm. Also yeah. made by Ryan Johnson, who also made the Last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to go this whole episode without. <laughs> oh my god, we will never be able to. It's go a good thing episode. we don't have alcohol. <laughs> yeah, we ran out. <laughs> Back to the Future is a nu- is a is a popular sci fi film. Mm-hmm. Like it's one where it really resonated with a lot of people. And so, it's a good time travel story. Yeah. Do you guys like Back to the Future? I like the car and the first one. The DeLorean? Yeah. I've never seen the what about movie. What about Back <laughs> to the Future cemented it in pop culture, like, history? Because I feel like who can not... Who's going to say, I watch this movie and I hate this movie? Like, it's just... It's, there's, it's what, average. What are we watching when it comes to Back to the Future? We're watching a guy get hit on by his mom in the past. <laughs> it's future trunks. And the future. Oh. I feel like there's something there with like Spielberg and well, all it's not, the, it's not it's, even a Spielberg movie. I know, but it's got the same like level yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. Weight. I think I think here's here's my my prediction. Number one, everything about it is iconic. Even the way Michael J. Fox is dressed mm-hmm. is is memorable, right? And then you've got the the catchphrases, great Scott. Yeah. Oh, gee, Doc, this is heavy. Like, it's good writing. It's a lot of good writing brought to life by great filmmaking. The car. Who's going to forget the DeLorean? Yeah. The design, right? Who's going to forget, um, you know, going to the past <laughs> and trying to go back to your house and then there's somebody else living, living there, yeah. right? And then same funny. with the future, when in Back to the Future Two and all that stuff. Um, there's just so many moments that it's just filled up, like the rock and roll, like him playing the yeah. the rock yeah. and roll, and them not being ready for it. Yeah. Your kids are gonna love it. It's just like, so you wanted that too, Marty. Here it is. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, that, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a movie where. The writing is on point. The filmmaking's on point. The acting is on point. I think it's just one of those movies where everything fires on all cylinders. I don't really know what's weak about it. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I couldn't. I mean, Biff. Isn't just the, a great bully villain, say, you know, bully, antagonist. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's just one of those movies that's just memorable. Mm. A great essay I saw on YouTube that mentioned this, that all time travel stories are essentially about one thing. How our choices matter. 
Mm. That's what every time travel story is about. Flashpoint. And the fact that, yes, mm. like the fact that when he went back in time, it and the way that he was able to speak to his father and his father was able to stand up for himself mm -hmm. and that changed that the future that changed or i should say the present right yeah. when he gets back his father's a different person and it realizes that all we all it takes is that one person to come into your life and to say hey i don't think this is really working for you try this and it literally has ramifications that completely change yeah. that that story so that's what good time travel stories do right is they in they help us appreciate and understand the weight of our choices now so that we can have a better future There are a few time travel movies that we have to talk about. Like what? Um, Tenet, oh. Interstellar. You're really funny. Is well, they are. They are. Travel? No, it's not. So I don't think All right. that one's worth talking about. It's right time. I guess, I've. I guess Inception would be time travel. Like the planet, it accelerates there, time. No, Listen, it's slowing the time. But in Tenet I've, and Interstellar, there is. Really I have travel. exhausted this list, so we may dedicate the rest of this time. To these films. How much time we got? We got the time. We got all the time. You have Let's do two this. minutes to talk. Each person has two minutes. All right. Okay, so one of the popular things to do is to combine sci-fi with action. Most of these movies do that, right? Mm -hmm. This is what Nolan has built a career on. At least mo a lot of his career has been built on this combination. Whether it's creating a, a heist film like Inception or creating a like a kind of like a space mission, if you will, with Interstellar. We got to talk about Nolan. We got to talk about some of these films because they are they're very influential sci-fi film, you know, mm -hmm. and they're films that have definitely changed the game in a lot of ways. So, I'll just start by saying that I think out of Inception, Interstellar, <laughs> and Tenet. I think Inception is the best of the three. That's just, a good choice. Your opinion, man. No, it is, it's that is just my opinion. That it's is a very my popular opinion. opinion. You are correct, and it is. I do know it is a popular opinion, and it is a well. What's the word? Decide is a good choice. It's a good movie. Well yeah. yeah, it's a good movie. I didn't. I didn't dislike that. Movie. It's not my favorite movie. Well crafted. Movie. But I think of these three, I think it's the best one. Why? Okay, some of it is personal and some of it is is ah, objective. Here we go. Okay, but you do see the you're, movies for how they were meant to be seen, right? I, no, listen. We are all blinded by personal experience because none of us can be wholly objective with any piece of <laughs> art true. or film that or story. Me. So, here's what I love about Inception. You Besides, no in the story, you're not one of Zimmer's best thing. scores ever. Don't agree, but not to me. I mean, you've got, you've got the dream is collapsing. You've got the song at the end of the film. You've got like so much good Zimmerified music in there. You've got easily, along with Avatar and Life of Pi, the game changer for visual effects in film. Mm -hmm. You could not have visual effects be as good as they are had it not been for those three films. And I, I still think Inception scenes, the scene where Leonardo DiCaprio and Ellen Page are walking through and he's trying to teach her about how to navigate the dream world and seeing how did Nolan shoot this? How did they create this? And just my mind being blown, the scene with Joseph Gordon-Levitt fighting in, mm -hmm. the, in the hallway of the mm -hmm. hotel room, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many just visually stunning moments in the film. But then, in addition to the aesthetics of the film, you've got a very interesting idea. Because, yes, there's a science fiction element of, okay, can you go into somebody's dreams and implant? Okay, at first you could think of that and be like, that's stupid. Obviously not. But besides the fact that there's all kinds of dream psychology out there about what dreams are and is there some way that we subconsciously communicate through just throwing all that aside 
the fact that the movie recognizes and does an interesting story with the fact that our dreams shape our reality. That's what the whole movie is about. So these guys want to, they want to bring about a dream within a person so that his reality will change. And because his reality changes, it's going to change for everybody else because that's how powerful he is. But then that's like the external like piece of the plot. But then you've got this idea of dreams shaping reality with Leonardo DiCaprio and his wife. Uh, what's her name? Ma. Uh, Ma, yeah. Ma. Maul. With Maul, right? So like Maul, like, like and Darth Maul? The, the like fact- Darth Maul? Like Maul, like bad in Spanish. Like uh, Maul. I think of Darth Maul now. <laughs> <laughs> Maul. That's all I'm thinking of <laughs> So the fact that you've got Maul and that they live in this dream world and they think they have this dream world figured out, kind of like a fantasy, but then that moment when she jumps yeah. and she loses her mind, Right? You lose your mind to your dreams when you're not tethered in reality. She was so far gone that she didn't even understand the implications of being away from her kids with what she was about to do, right? Mm -hmm. She was so lost in her dreams th and that she gave herself to them. That's what that moment means to me when she does that. She fully gives herself to the lie mm -hmm. and she literally detaches from reality because she dies, right? or whatever happens to her there. But that idea of dream shaping reality, because now the villain, the antagonist of the film is a guy's subconscious projections of the guilt he feels about his role in his wife's demise. That's powerful because you're, you are the own antagonist in your story when you allow mm -hmm. your dreams and your subconscious without inner healing, right? Without mm -hmm. yeah. doing that work, when you don't <laughs> when when you don't deal with that, it literally becomes the antagonist in your life, in your story. And it's so much so that it actually has consequences that all the other people in this dream could die if he does not get his crap under control. Yeah, it bleeds if into he, other people's dreams. I thought that was And the crazy. idea that those messy things that we don't deal with affect other people, right? So even though it's set in a dream world, it's very much communicating ideas about the real world and about us. And so, you know, it has a great ending. It has a very iconic ending as well. I think it's got good performances, not the greatest perform, not like amazing performances, but everybody does what they're there to do and they, and they do it well. So that's Inception for me. Now compare that <laughs> with Tenet. Okay. How now do you see Tenet? Okay. We're skipping Interstellar, I could Right say. now we are skipping Interstellar. Okay. We're going to go back Maybe to we'll it. come back to we it. We will. No, we will. Okay. Because on paper, uh -huh. will, on paper, as you read this in the script and you think- For ideal, Inception or Tenet? I, inception. Okay. Idea-wise, it sounds like Inception should be a better movie. Yes. On paper. Yes. But then we watch it. Mm -hmm. And I still think it's a great. It movie. could be a different story. Now, now, what are your thoughts on Tenet? Okay, my thoughts on Tenet are going to explain what also my weakness, what I think is a weakness with Inception. So here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get ready, boys. Lay the halls. I think Nolan is a great filmmaker, and he creates great filmmaking experiences. Mm -hmm. Tenant is a good experience that you can have with a film, right? Because it's interesting. There's a lot of interesting ideas and things going on. There's a lot of cool things going on uh, with, with it as a film, right? There is no doubt that Nolan is a great director and he's great as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Where's your butt? So, yeah. and he's got stories that have great themes and, and you know, the settings, the, 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 it comes to life. I think Nolan, in my conceited, arrogant opinion, <laughs> in and of himself, is not the greatest when it comes to two things, writing and characters. Even my favorite Nolan movies, 
even my favorite, and my, my two favorite Nolan movies are Memento and The Dark Knight. Even my favorite yeah. Nolan movies, it's like a steel cold table. Mm-hmm. I don't get any warmth from his characters. Mm-hmm. I don't get, I don't feel any emotion. The only reason why I feel emotion for the Dark Knight is not Nolan. It's who, who those characters are to me in terms of Batman, right? The only reason why Memento, the, the main character Memento, that's the only character I ever felt something for in any of his films. That's it. And it just it just so happens that that character represents probably my greatest personal fear. One of my greatest personal fears, which, which is, is losing your mind, you losing mm. your memory mm. and having your reality determined by somebody else and not by you. Yeah. Which is easily one of my greatest fears. And that movie literally plays on that fear. Which, <laughs> which is pretty close to Inception also. Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. That's why I probably like Inception okay. too. That's why I said there's a personal thing I think going on with Inception. No doubt about it. But his characters feel like steel cold tables. I don't feel, even Interstellar, which I will give Interstellar credit that he tries. Yeah. He tries to make characters that you feel something for. He has emotion. Characters that have dramatic moments in Interstellar that are lacking in almost every one of his films. Yeah. I still don't feel for them. Really? I still don't. It's not that I don't care. As it's a father, you didn't, you didn't cry feel. when he was watching his, his no. daughter's recordings? No. Really? My goodness. No. I, I cried. My goodness. I, I, felt, I, I felt something, but I didn't cry. That was the, Derek, I felt something. Derek, I'm I, not saying there was no emotion. I teared up four times in that movie. Bro. Like, my ears got wet. <laughs> that's ears fine. ears got wet. <laughs> I said ears, I, yeah, I said eyes. I think you said ears, bro. That's <laughs> that's a medical condition, that's, but my eyes were leaking so too. So that's fine. I think Interstellar is his best attempt at that. I, I totally agree with that. But again, this is not about Interstellar. You're asking me about Tenet and Inception. So the things that I think Nolan's weaknesses are, the, char- the cold characters... Because characters don't feel like people. They feel like ideas and philo- philosophical right. concepts. Yeah, and even in Inception, like even, the subconscious, oh yeah. most of the bodies on screen are not even... Well, and they're, just, they're just like tools. Completely the agree. They yeah. are tools for Nolan. And most of his films are... And like a that. lot of his characters don't talk like real people. They yeah. talk like Nolan. Yeah. Mm. You know, even in things like The Dark Knight that I love, most of those characters... Their dialogue takes me out of the movie because I'm like, real people do not talk like this, <laughs> right? It's good screenplay talk. It's good direct, like film talk, but it doesn't feel real to me. It feels artificial, right? <clears throat> so another thing that makes Nolan's films artificial feel artificial to me is the way he tries to explain things. I don't think his science fiction is always very well done. <laughs> no, it's, it's really I, convoluted. Let me just say before you keep going, uh-huh. I have agreed with pretty much everything that you okay. have just said. Okay. Like Great. we are in agreement. Fantastic. Let's keep <laughs> yeah. it going. So keep it going. I, I don't think he explains his science and like the prestige, which I like the prestige quite a lot, but that had me scratching my head a whole bunch of times watching that. Same with Inception, same with Interstellar, same with Tenet, right? All these movies where he uses these, it, it's like a pseudoscience that he creates. And I'm just like, am I just stupid? Like, yes. am I, can I just not follow what he's trying to say? But then I realized as well, in my favorite Nolan movies, he's not the main writer. Oh. It's his brother. It's his brother or somebody else. He has a brother? Yeah, Jonathan it's Nolan. two brothers. And two brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and I've realized that all the movies, all the movies where it's just him writing, which are Inception on. Wait, Inception he wrote only? Yes, Inception. I think Dark Knight Rises. I'm not 100 percent sure. Interstellar, Dunkirk, mm-hmm. Tenet, and then um, Oppenheimer coming he wrote, out. He wrote by himself. Those are all solo him. Mm-hmm. So he's not in collaboration, and that's when I think he's not as strong as a writer because here's my unpopular statement. Here it is. Since inception, every film he has actually, I'll go back even further since the dark Knight. every film he makes that comes next is worse than the one before it. Dark Knight's here. Then inception's a little, little less good than dark Knight. Then 
Um, Dark Knight Rises is not as good as Inception. Then Interstellar's not as good as... Dark Knight Rises is one of his worst movies. Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> I, I really think it's one of his worst movies. I understand. It, it, it is. Dunkirk, not as good as Interstellar. But Tenet, Dunkirk not as good. good. Tenet, not as good as... Right? So all his movies are getting worse for me as he goes on. Ever since The Dark Knight. And I think a lot of that is it's him. It's just him. And he doesn't have these collaborators, at least from what I can tell when I look up on IMDb and stuff, it looks like he's trying to do everything more of himself. And I think that's when his films... So Tenet, all that to say, Tenet represents everything I don't like about Nolan up to 11. It is his worst characters in any film that I felt nothing for. I did not care for anybody in that film there is no reason it gave me to care about them beyond, hey, this is an important character, so you should care about them. I didn't care about them. I didn't feel anything for these people. The pseudoscience is so <laughs> batshit crazy. <laughs> <in tenet. laughs> Joe, Joe, it does not. I can't. Do you I, are not going to understand this movie? Figure it out. But not that only, doesn't make it bad or not, not only watchable. Is the pseudoscience okay. it's so funny? But not only is the pseudoscience like crazy, literally <laughs> the plotting of the movie is is bad. Bro. Like I like struggling to see what are they like the dialogue. There is so much dialogue where I'm like, what are they talking about right now? Like this is a conversation about nothing. This is just empty crap that I'm sitting here watching, wasting two and a half hours. Derek, that is one Derek, way. This is one way to put it. Wait, Derek life. is Derek is uh Wait. is Jim Carrey in the Truman Show when his wife is uh doing a commercial. <laughs> so what are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> and true. I'm just like, why are we here? And now we're following this like Russian guy, and now we gotta go here and follow this person. Russian. What is happening? Who is this person? Why should I care about? about them and then on top about that uh, on top of all that we get this ending where they oh, just the throw in so well and by the way don't even get me started how terrible the sound design is the music oh. is so over blaringly oh. drowning out what's happening on screen and you can read about this you can read about how people wrote in theaters how the dialogue was like i'm sure it had to have been adjusted by now because the oh, dialogue okay. yeah. is just so muffled less. and yeah but then you get this ending where they throw this throwaway line of dialogue that it? I'm like, what is it? Where it basically, I'm like, did they just hint that this guy created Tenet? Yes. Yeah. And I'm just like, did I hear oh, that right? Like, Whoa. literally, you, you dude, bro, you <laughs> doesn't even matter, bro. If you hear this, <laughs> let spoilers be damn. You, you who cares? <laughs> so, Wait, oh. he says spoilers be damn. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you have this throwaway line there, of no. just like, oh, by the way, I created te like, what is this movie? He didn't say and, I created and Tenet. He said most, you created Tenet. And whatever, whatever. You haven't figured and it out the by now? Most, the <laughs> most egregious sin of that movie is that it will probably only be good if I watch it again. So I have to give this man who already took two and a half hours of my precious time with a wife and two kids and a full-time entrepreneurial job. I only get to watch one movie a week by myself. And in order to appreciate this, I have to watch it again. And that's five hours of my freaking time watching this garbage movie when I could be watching Blade Runner 2049 or God knows what that has some substance and meaning to it. Oh, you just didn't get it. Just watch it again and it'll be better. Who's got time for that? Nolan, I'm sorry, but nah, I'm done. Ah, wait. He turned the mic. Wait. <laughs> oh. You can watch it with friends. Oh. Yeah, hey, viewers, I haven't watched Tenet, bro. So, like, I don't know. I don't know what happened in this movie, but it, this is fun. What's okay. funny is that we're about to present the literal, literal only two ways of seeing this movie. Because there's really only two. Okay. There's that, and then there's yeah, I really don't, about to I really don't refute what you're saying. That's the thing. <laughs> So that's you know thing, why like, I give it one and a half stars. That's an understandable take, but there is another take. I w I'm ready for it. I wish I could explain it because I still don't understand the movie. So I, <laughs> that's, the, that's the point. Wait, but, what? but, but. What I kind can, of Wait, wait, wait. wait we're going to do our we? best. We're going to do our best. Okay, okay. Hey, so I watched it only one time. Okay. I watched it like four or five I times. I watched it one time. Still don't get it. 
And here's the thing. I think that, one, I didn't get the whole part of the movie, but the suspension of disbelief for me, it was so fun trying to figure it out and just being like, eh, whatever. I'm going to just watch it and see how much I can understand and enjoy. That was five minutes into the movie for me. It was it was just fun. Um, I could follow it for the most part. Not me. He the the guy was <laughs> doing a job. Than me too. So the guy was doing a job for the government. He was the only one who actually took the suicide pill, and because of right. his commitment, I, that was they, I followed all that. They recruited him into something called Tenet. Right. It's and, it's after he's recruited in Tenet that it starts I'll losing you. me. So yes, I'll help you. The, she he goes to the lady that shows him the bullet that has been that has had its time inverted. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's like, so this is what we're fighting, and she goes, no, the implications are much bigger than that. So to track where this is coming from, he has to go to where the bullet came from, <laughs> and the ammunition had come from the woman Priya, who was in the tower that he and uh, mm-hmm. Robert Pattinson jetted up to, and she said, well. Actually, they're from this Russian guy, but no one gets uh, really to him except his wife. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, so to know where the inverted bullets are coming from and the inverted pieces are coming from, we have to go to this Russian guy. Yeah. And then there's the emotional plot with his estranged wife. Yeah. They try to set things up with, uh, against him from there. They have the fight with uh, the inverted stranger, uh-huh. which was... I thought was a really funky but kind of cool fight choreography. Uh huh. Excuse me. It's basically there's a couple fights, and especially this one where the the main character is fighting someone who is living life like I don't know how to say backwards in time. Yeah. But on the other end of that fight, the other person fighting him is live in his perception. Is fighting normally, and the main right, character right, right. is the one fighting backwards, mm-hmm. and it has this whole inverse view of look. I know you're like, yeah, okay. I no, 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 no. I'm falling. I'm falling. So they go from I'm there. Yeah, that sorry. this is <laughs> when it does start to lose me. I will be honest. Like there are parts where I'm like, wait, what's going on? And I had to think. Oh, okay, okay. Now I get it. Towards the end of the movie, I was tired and like I started to kind of lose track of what was going on, but. For me, understanding exactly how it works, being able to explain it, being able to pinpoint all of it, I had realized that way more time had gone into creating the moments in these movies where the pseudoscience is in, where I could spend time trying to unravel that, but that wasn't the main part of the movie that I needed to focus on. Mm. What I needed to focus on was... This guy was at this seat of ultimate power. He could decide when the world ends. And he was so measurable with life that because of the entire, like the entirety of the world could be decided by this person mm-hmm. selfishly. And the protagonist. Oh, yeah. Which is also his by the way, wait, 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 wait. You had your turn. Wait, 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 wait. Go Hold ahead. On. Go ahead. Hold on. So I thought it was really cool how this guy had give the character no damn actual- name. He had no. He had I no. I think there's a reason for that. He I'm sure no there name. is. He was just a person who was loyal and dedicated uh-huh. to not to something bigger than himself. Mm-hmm. So that's what it took. And someone who is a mentor and a friend. Mm-hmm. But what was cool about that is, I don't know how to. I'm not going to spoil it. I know you don't care, but I think it's going to throw me off my point. Either way, there was a lot of humanity in this. I thought that it wasn't like as emotionally deep as Interstellar, but there was a clear friendship there. I did like the characters. I didn't think that they were super cold. Um, and it was just fun to watch. There's a, like when I just kind of like, all right, I'm just going to watch it and enjoy it and like let the suspension of disbelief kind of kick in. It's the comparison, right? I'm comparing this to other Nolan films. I'm comparing this to other types of stories within the sci-fi genre. Mm. If you're going to have a sci-fi film about this idea that you can go back and change the past, because that's essentially what Tenet's you you can do, right? Mm -hmm. You can invert time and all that. I think that's a great idea. Wasted. Guts. Wasted opportunity. 
They don't ever do anything interesting with it beyond just what it what it's trying he to do. He gets frostbite from a, like an explosion. I thought that was hilarious. He gets frostbite from an explosion. Yeah, the, time is inverse. Yeah. So, oh, so as, he, as this guy oh, walks okay, forward okay, in time, okay. everything else is moving backwards to him. Okay. I'm not which saying actually looks really cool. I'm not saying there aren't interesting ideas, but I'm just saying if Nolan thought this is the movie that was going to save movie theaters during COVID. You know what's funny is because the theme of this movie is actually the perfect post-COVID movie to watch. Mm. Like, How so? Uh, give, give me some time. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been watching so much Nolan in my mind. Hey, you five minutes. First yeah. of all, first of all, I Inception is there's something wrong with Leonardo DiCaprio. I think. I think part of the reason why Interstellar is so emotional is because Matthew McConaughey is the main character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think he is such a good, genuine I think he uh, is personality too. Yeah. where I think Leonardo DiCaprio really lacks that. It's just I don't buy him and his wife at all in the movie. I find <coughs> nothing really there um, that is genuine. I, we're I, wa- we're, I can watching, totally see, we're yep. watching just, totally in see a that. sense, stock characters going through. The mm-hmm. story is overtaking what's actually happening on screen. I think Nolan is so... He's trying so hard. And I think Jared Leto is like this Inception is like the human Jared Leto. It's just trying too hard. I think I think this wow. story, even, 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 even in even at the end where like the climax of the film, it's like husband and wife. There is so much exposition going on with how the story is unfolding. Mm-hmm. At multiple points in Inception, it stops just to talk about what is happening in the movie. And Listen, the movie, hold on, and the movie ends up stopping with it. Mm-hmm. The movie does not continue forward. It is I, like, it is, it is not the easiest watch. Like if you, I've I seen agree. it a bunch of times. I've seen all these movies a bunch of times. And for me, Inception would be the least fun to watch, to mm-hmm. watch again. That has some kind of factor in the quality of the movie. C.S. Lewis says that the more you watch a movie, the more fun it is. Yeah. The better it gets. The second, third, and fourth viewing. And Inception gets worse for me mm-hmm. as I watch it. Personally. That's me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree that nothing will compare to the first time you see Inception. But even the first time I saw it. That's you. I don't remember. But, well, but for uh, no, me, I, I can speak. Was the, was I was in the theater. So I can speak to seeing it uh, just now. And yeah. maybe it was like just the timing because I was having a busy day. But in comparison to Interstellar and Tenet... There was something that was keeping me going the whole time. With Interstellar, I had been primed up with this father figure who right. I did like. Yeah. I loved he said he wasn't the calm one, but he was. The way he was so steady and proud of his daughter. Mm-hmm. I complete like Nick was saying, I believe that, that he is her father. Yeah. yeah. I believe yeah. that those yeah. are his, yeah. those are his kids and they love him. Even when she got suspended in school. They had a really good yeah. human relationship. The, yeah. Their personalities were well developed. It was really yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I totally bought it. I was torn up uh, when I saw uh, him watching I, the videos oh from the past. Goodness. So what kept me going was that emotional yearning for. I wanted to see reconciliation. Yeah, and that yearning was con- contrasted with a continuing spiral of hopelessness that drew these characters further and further apart, and yeah. that kept me going. With Tenet, it was this ludicrous, absolutely, I don't know what's going on, but I'm trying to figure out, and I'm kind of getting there, this action, Mm -hmm. this story that I was starting to learn. There was an emotional connection, I felt, with the main character and this woman who was in that abusive relationship with the with the main antagonist. Yeah. And what I liked about that was it wasn't based off on... Based on a uh, a romantic interest, right, right, it was right. just pure human devotion to another, yeah, wanting to help out and guardianship. I thought that was really cool, but the the suspension of disbelief, the action that was just <coughs> absurd, kept me going. Mm-hmm. With Inception, I just was waiting for the next like thing, like, mm-hmm. and the, the action was inconsequential. There was a lot of despair and just mental spiral in Leonardo DiCaprio's character Cobb, but it wasn't rounded out by the positive emotions to make that mm-hmm. despair deeper. Mm-hmm. I didn't see any warmth with his wife or with his kids. It was just a, uh, he was just haunted, but that was it. Mm. And it, there was a decay. 
but that was it. There was no warmth. I didn't see like a warm cold, uh, not warm cold, that cold steel sense. table. It was cold steel table <laughs> because all that we saw of his wife was like I the think, haunting image of what he could remember. We didn't see yeah. the fullness of his wife and his family, which makes sense because he couldn't remember that. And right. that plays into the movie, but that also made it harder to, to feel something Sure, for sure. It. Personally, I think Inception is the coldest of the three. Um, I, there's no way in my mind it's colder think, than Tenet. So, so Tenet Interstellar, sneaks, I'll Tenet, give you that. Tenet, Interstellar, it's definitely a warmer film. Tenet sneaks up on you in a really subtle way. So Tenet is cool because it's like a Rubik's Cube. Hmm. That's already been played with and it's in the <laughs> middle of being messed up and you have it in your home and you see it on the table and you're like, I'll play with it today. You uh-huh. still don't figure it out, put it down, come back to it another day and you just constantly are playing with this toy. It, it, I think that's cool. Hmm. Um, right off the bat, John David Washington and Robert Pattinson are both infinitely more entertaining and charismatic than uh, everyone in Inception. I think that John David Washington is awesome in the film. I think mm-hmm. he's funny. I think there's multiple lines of dialogue where there's real humor as opposed to Inception where I think there's very, very little. Um, I think that the opening is maybe the best opening scene in any of Nolan's films. The ballet scene is awesome. Just flat out, it's a great scene. I think that this movie, Nolan is really not. You mean you mean Tenet? It's Tenet. the best opening scene in in Nolan's maybe film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Tenet, opening the, scene with the ballet, the ballet and the orchestra, scene, yeah. and all that. Yeah. I think it's really good. I don't think Nolan is really trying to explain things that hard. I think it's moving so fast and he's so carefree mm-hmm. that he is operating like like freely, and he's saying, "Just let me take you." And it moves so fast. The whole movie is constant forward motion where Inception is stopping a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, like and it's said, a, he didn't even have time to eat in that no, movie. And it's a good ride. And as they're like explaining things, like multiple times, other characters are like, don't think about it too hard. Like they're literally telling you, like, are you confused yet? Like, this is not even that important. Just keep coming with us. Um, just keep coming. Just, just, yeah. just keep coming. Yeah. Just keep yeah. coming. The, <laughs> if you look at it in the sense of this is like a James Bond film, mm. because the, the Russian guy with mm-hmm, all mm-hmm. the power in the world to destroy the world, like right. nobody knows where it came from. Nobody knows how it happened. It doesn't really matter. If there's a villain and he's got the power to destroy the world and you got to stop the world. Stop them from the world blowing up. That's the plot. That's right. all you got to know. Right. Yeah. Essentially. <laughs> the heart of the movie is that it's a it's like a buddy cop movie. It's about the friendship between Robert Pattinson and John David Washington. Mm-hmm. So I think, and I'm still trying to figure this out. I'm five watches in, but I haven't really paid attention <laughs> in most of them. But, hey, uh, but but hold on. But I think John David movie, Washington. Twelve and a half hours of your life. Yeah, and I'd give it more. That you've done and, outside, and I would yeah. give it more. John David Washington <laughs> is going forward in time, mm-hmm. and Robert Pattinson is going backwards in time. time. I did the get that. The whole movie. I got that. Yes, the whole movie. I did get that. John David Washington and Robert Pattinson are best friends. John David Washington's going forward and doesn't know him. Yeah. And, John, and Robert Pattinson's slowly breaking things down, like what's happening, because in the future, John David Washington sent Robert Pattinson back to save the world. Mm-hmm. He was his mentor. And then he ends up being mentored by his best friend that he taught. So at the oh, very oh, end, yeah. at the like very that. climax move at the mm-hmm. end, they realize that they're, they have known each other for a long time. Mm-hmm. And John David Washington looks at him and go, at the very end, Robert Pattinson says that this is the end of a beautiful friendship. Yep. But it's just the beginning Any for you. For you. Yep. And John David Washington realizes how much that he means to him and how much, because Robert Pattinson at the end gives his life for the, for the whole world. He sacrifices his life for John David Washington. So at the very climax, the heart is their relationship. And as you watch again, you see multiple times that Robert Pattinson knows that John David Washington, like he knows that they're best friends and he wants to like, like engage in that yeah. way, but he can't. And John David Washington mm-hmm. doesn't know it. And it's really, really cool. But he does uh, it warmly. Like there's like a kindness and you're like... Why, how are they friends this quickly? But yeah. then you go. There is a genuineness oh. to their relationship. Mm-hmm. And he even <coughs> cries at the end. Like there is warmth. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think uh, there's just so much more, dude. Like n- almost none of it makes sense. Like because <laughs> things are happening forward and backwards at the same time. Yeah, and so the action is just kind of crazy. It, it, um, yeah, but if you just put this movie on and watch it. For me, you're gonna have a better time than if you just put Inception on and watch it. Mm-hmm. Inception may be like thought out better, um, but 
if you're scrolling on TV and Tenet's on and Inception's on, I'm putting Tenet on. I'm not putting Inception on. I'd rather watch this. I have more fun watching this. These guys are, I want to be a part of this world. I don't want to know anybody in the Inception world. I don't care about these people. These people are all subconscious images. They're, none of them are real. Right. But in Tenet, a few, of those ca- a few of them are real. Oh, okay. and, it's, and it's cool. So there's an interesting dilemma that this creates then, right? Interstellar maybe is the middle ground between this. Yeah. yeah. But you've got one film with um, Inception where you've got, what would you even call them? Like non-realistic characters? What was the word that you used a moment ago? They're really just all just avatars for just okay. So we'll, we'll stock, call them like avatars for ideas, yeah. right? Yeah, CPUs. but but <laughs> the ideas with Inception and the themes of it, if you actually think about them and apply them to your life, are very very important. So there's so more. Hold on, I'm not. Hold on, let me finish. Though. Let me finish though. <laughs> Tenet. Maybe it does have better characters. Maybe it has people you want to spend more time with that are more realistic and less Avatar, right? I would like to know from you, Nick, what is it about Tenet in terms of how does sci-fi make us better people? How does Tenet do that for you? Because when I walked away from that movie, I felt nothing in terms of how my life, like at least Inception got me thinking about do I spend too much time in my dream world, in my fantasies? Do, what does it mean to be detached from those you love? How, you know, what, it, what are the ideas that are shaping my life? You could walk away from Inception and do some very good self-therapy to think about your life. I would like to know from Tenet, what do you get out of it? That you could do that with. Um, so before that, I was going to say... Besides this, the buddy. Yeah. No, before that, I was going to say there is a lot more complexity to Inception. There is less complexity to Tenet, but it's not trying to be complex. It's more of just a pure action sci-fi movie. And it's, See, I that's- disagree. I think it's trying to be overly complicated. Like, you literally have to jump through all these hoops to get somewhere. Like, oh, there's this drawing, and so it's I a think- counterfeit drawing. And no, I'm just I like, think- who cares about this art? I don't. Like- I say, I think there, I think you're missing something there because it, it's John David Washington in two parts of the movie sits down to have lunch and dinner with people and gets up within two <laughs> minutes and, mm-hmm. and doesn't eat any food. Like, there's no. Right. It's mm-hmm. not. It's not necessarily the point. Like. Inception is trying so hard to get through all of its complex themes to create this one moment. Mm -hmm. And Tenet is not. It's complex in just its nature of time going forward and time going back at the same time. But it's moving. The pace that it's moving at is more important than the exposition. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Um, The the complexity is what? A red herring? Is uh that the way you'd call it? Yes. Yes. The complexity is not supposed to be as complex as you think. I I don't think. So basically, basically, what happens in Tenet mm-hmm. is that John David Washington and Robert Pattinson's friendship, mm-hmm. their friendship saves the world. Right. Their but- relationship, their friendship, Robert Pattinson laying his life down for mm-hmm. John David Washington saves the world. Right. But it's more than that. Okay. John David Washington, um, he is acting and moving out of faith. And believing mm-hmm. that if everyone around us can act and move out of faith together, then we can stop the world. The the satyr, the evil guy, says um, he he has no faith. He has no faith. He just wants control. And mm-hmm. and uh, he calls John David Washington. You're a fanatic. Your your faith blinds mm-hmm. you. You're a fanatic. You don't mm-hmm. even know what you're believing in. But his heart is pushing towards that we can do this together mm-hmm. if we if we work together. Mm-hmm. Um, to say it more briefly or more succinctly, there's this. So then we understand that tenant as a secretive concept sent back through time to signal with the word and the hand sign is a method the protagonist creates to ferret out those who would misuse the power of aversion in the algorithm. Um, tenant means a principle or belief, especially uh, one of the main principles of religion or philosophy. The protagonist has the faith and belief Seder completely lacks. Uh, the collective future is always in play if you have the ability to see outside preconceptions of any norm or concept. It's about having the courage to see it and acting to achieve the world that reflects your values. The protagonist kills himself at the beginning of the movie with cyanide out of this exact obligation to others. He doesn't succeed and his team dies, but this is the act that qualifies him to learn about Tenet a value he himself will establish in the far future. So basically he's saying, 
uh, I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> that the future is always in play, that we together have the ability to reach what, to reach the values that we hold dear mm -hmm. and bring that forth in the future, despite whatever evil presence is happening. Mm -hmm. And my relationship with you will help save the world mm -hmm. because you are committed to me and I'm committed to you and I will go back in time for you. And you go and, back in time and, for me. And we're, with, <laughs> and we're withholding information from each yeah. other for the greater good, working together as a team. Mm -hmm. And that is what saves the world. And that is really a flip of the of the espionage male archetype of all James Bond movies. Mm. Um, so that is a cool part of this movie. I enjoy that aspect of it. I enjoy the fact that it doesn't make sense. Like I can just sit back and go, I don't know what's happening, but this is fun. And then and then <laughs> I can fun. slowly like, oh wait, that's what he means. And then oh wait, mm. this is what's happening. Another thing is at the very end, Robert Pattinson says. Um, this is the end of a beautiful friendship, and it's a direct homage to Casablanca. Mm. Where at the end he goes, he goes, you know what, Louis? This is the beginning of a beautiful friendship, right? Yeah. And it's their friendship in Casablanca being a homage to Tenet mm -hmm. in different ways. Mm -hmm. I thought it yeah. was clever. I thought it was cool. There's even more. So, like, even in the beginning, it says there are no friends. We live in a twilight world. There are no friends at dusk. Mm -hmm. And this one was like I couldn't figure this one out, but I was in Reddit trying to figure out. <laughs> But basically, John David Washington was reborn in the beginning when he took the pill, mm -hmm. and he was in dawn, moving towards dusk. Mm. And at dusk is when he loses Robert Pattinson. Mm -hmm. um, or one thing said that Robert Pattinson was twilight, mm -hmm. and he was constantly shedding light mm -hmm. on John yeah. David Washington. Mm -hmm. And another one was like, he's just making fun of twilight, because Dust. Robert Pattinson's in right. the movie. Right, right. I thought that was, <laughs> oh, those are fun to think yeah. about. Yeah, that's funny. Um, <laughs> Regardless, we're watching movies and we're trying to be entertained. Mm. Um, and you could have a good idea here, but really, I think, not really nail it in its execution. Mm. Um, even if like the storytelling kind of hits it, the characters and the acting still matter. Mm. And I think Inception falls flat there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a little too self-important and self-serious. And I think Tenet is way more free-flowing and, and just like kind of wild. And I, I'm just like, oh, I'm going to jump on this train. Mm -hmm. I don't want to jump on this train. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know where else to go in my brain right now. No, that's good. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing what you like about it because it helps me gain a greater appreciation for it as well. Because, you know, then I see the things that you see in it. Dude, dude there's, there's... I think, I think... <laughs> yeah, I know. We're going to wrap this one up here, right? That was, that was all the energy you had. Yeah. I think we're all, we're all spent at this point. Wait, wait, wait. And then... And then... <laughs> oh, man. And then... Like, hold on. I need to find... Are we still going to talk a little bit about Interstellar? Or no. Done? We're done. <laughs> unless so, you... Unless so, you have, for unless those you watching... Have and then... Please go, and watch, then, please go watch Interstellar. Unless no. you have something you really no. want to say. And then... I really want to say And then the protagonist only becomes the protagonist... At the very end of the movie. Uh -huh. And he says, no, you're working for me. I'm the protagonist of this story. And this, this little article says, in achieving his task with the help of the people he trusts, he has ensured his own idealized future as well as a better outcome for the world he inhibits. Mm. Um, that is the ultimate expression of the concept of a protagonist, a belief in the self-acquisition of our own best possibility, mm. even when you can't immediately see it for yourself, yeah. which one achieved and can save the world and guide it to better days. So he's named the protagonist, but only becomes the protagonist at the very end of the movie. That's fair. Well, the mm. switch, well, I thought it was cool. So he is a pro protagonist. Right, there's multiple the protagonists mm. of the but movie. But he became, becomes the protagonist. Yeah. In fact, in the story, he is because he's the founder of Tenant. Right. What he goes on to complete comes all the way back to the past. The whole thing was what they call a temporal pincer attack. He's going. Oh, he's I, yeah, which I have no idea. But the the operation try. was something they're going from the past to attack and then coming back from the future to do. Yeah. So it all came from him. So he was a protagonist, and then he becomes the because he uh, comes up to this woman who was part of the story mm -hmm. uh, to protect one of his friends, and the one thing he says is, "See, I had it wrong." The whole time I wasn't working for you. We were both working for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's funny, actually. Yeah, that's good. Good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. It has yeah, a, it's fun. a highly quotable movie. No one cares about the uh, the bomb that didn't go off. Like there, there's a lot of quotes to that. And movie. and one more, <laughs> the the lunch scene with Michael Caine 
in Tenet is a better scene than anything that's happened in Inception. Oh. That scene wow. is wow. Re- that scene wow. is I really funny it. and really slick. The obligatory Nolan Michael Caine came and Michael Caine's the Michael Caine's appearance in that as he's just chowing down on his lunch and speaking every line. He probably worked on that scene for like twenty minutes. <laughs> and then yeah. like, but that that's scene close. is awesome. There's a lot well, of there's a lot of I appreciate scenes. everything you share. I think at the end of the day, when it comes to sci-fi, we think about what <laughs> kind of stories I can acknowledge like all the things you're saying with Tenet, right? I think for me, I can acknowledge you too. For me, right? And that's why Tenet, and that's why Tenet is a cool movie. But and that's why The Last Jedi is a good movie too. No, don't even start. No, but I think what you get out of Tenet, I get through other films. Uh So I don't need Tenet to give that to me, right? And I think that's the thing is like Tenet is a messy execution of what I find other places. Inception for me gives me something that I don't get a lot of places, not just in terms of, you know, filmmaking stuff, but in terms of a really this grappling of this idea about dreams and reality and how they affect you. I can't name too many films that I could think of where I'm going to wrestle with that particular idea. Nightmare on Elm Street. No, I'm not saying there aren't any. Nightmare on Elm Street's a great movie. There's just not many. Whereas Tenet, if if it's the whole like buddies are going to save the world, I can think of a ton of movies where I get that. If I want a complex movie that I'm just along for the ride, that's Barton Fink. That's the Coen brothers. There's tons of movies that I can get that from, right? So when it comes to science fiction at the end of the day, I think science fiction speaks to, well, the science fiction you gravitate towards, I should say speaks to what you find important about uh, your place in the world and about what the threats that you see, right? Um, In terms of our existence. And I think the greater you see that threat, the more you're curious to see how that's going to unfold through a science fiction film. So I guess as we're wrapping up, guys, do you guys have any final thoughts on this? Um, each of those three movies had a part where I was like, I have no idea what's going on. Inception, Interstellar, and that's fair. That same. Yeah. Yeah. They all had a, same. some hole that I like tripped same. in. I'm like, out I don't. Of, know out of seven hours, I probably understood four of them, <laughs> and three of the missing hours, probably an hour and forty five from ten. So <laughs> I have really only seen Interstellar fully. So. I like that movie because of the father and daughter plot and yeah. the humanity and that type of stuff with it. So, yeah. Any final thoughts about the genre in general? Mars Attacks is underrated. High key. <laughs> <laughs> Mars Attack. You should just watch it to just see. Wait, wait, yeah. wait. Just, just hear them talk. <laughs> Uh, is, is this going to be like a token thing where Nick brings a Burton film into every genre conversation? He a, a, if he has a film for every genre. Hey, listen, when we go to horror, shot, when we go film. to horror, yeah. you definitely got some good ones yeah, for Burton. No, I, have, I like Sleepy Hollow. I like Batman Returns, Edward Scissorhands, Night Before Christmas. Well, yes, Nightmare Mars Before Christmas. Horror, horror, get ready for Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd's good too. We got to talk. Oh, yeah, we, we have good. to talk about well, Sweeney yeah, Todd for horror. Sure. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> it's one of my favorite Burton films. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up here. We're all exhausted. It's been a long evening. So thank you so much for tuning in for our Why We Love Sci-Fi episode. Go check out my letterbox if you want to see an example of different sci-fi films, ones that I didn't even talk about uh, on the episode here as well. There's lots of great sci-fi. Happy to recommend out there. And wherever you are at, I hope you are living a meaningful story and that you are using science fiction to inform the way that you interact with the world and help us as it helps us wrestle with the big questions and wondering, is there hope for humanity yet? Well, I think good sci-fi can give us that hope. And so this is your friendly narrative practitioner, Derek, signing off saying thank you so much. And until next time. (laughs) Yeah, slice and dice. (laughs) Been the dessert. (laughs) 